This is how we got to sexy. <laughs> the long view. Uh, this morning, um, when I rolled out of bed, uh, my girlfriend was not there. My dog was there. And I headed into the bathroom. And after sort of dealing with the first sex of the morning, um, I, I, I went and I stood over the sink and I looked up. And there, this is something some of you may have experienced. I, in the mirror, I saw me. My first encounter of the day was with myself. And some of you may be familiar with this ritual. I would assume almost everybody here has had that early morning encounter with yourself. And this relationship between the I and the I is something that's very normal to us. What's interesting, and what I want to talk with you about for a while this evening, is um, that prior to the 1830s, most people had never seen a clear image of themselves or a reflection of themselves. People knew about reflections. They had been near water. But in fact, to understand oneself as an image was something that was relatively modern and insofar as it existed, it was a prerogative of people in power and of people or artists who were patronized by people in power. Mirrors, of course, if you've ever been to the Met, they have mirrors from various cultures of antiquity and this is what they look like. But as you'll notice here, the quality of the image in these, in these mirrors was terrible. You could barely see yourself. Um, I have, some of them were silver or gold polished. Some of them, particularly in the Americas, were made of obsidian, which is polished volcanic rock. And I have at home an obsidian mirror and I actually took a self-portrait of myself the other day in that mirror and this is it. So these images were of very poor quality. And this is something that St. Paul recognized in 1 Corinthians when he used the now well-known phrase, for now we see through a glass darkly. A reference to the poor quality of reflection that one sees in a, in a looking glass or in some kind of primitive mirror. The first optically precise mirrors, which allowed people to see an optically precise image of themselves, did not appear until the period between the 14th and 16th centuries in Europe. And the first, the first ones were made out of um, polished rock crystal, and they were beyond imagination in terms of their, their value. And it wasn't until uh, the 14th century and 15th century that the first recorded glass mirrors were produced uh, on the Venetian glassmaking island of Murano. And by the 15th and 16th centuries, Murano glassmakers had perfected a technique a secret technique. These glassmakers were not allowed to leave the island. They were basically prisoners there, well taken care of, but prisoners, who produced the first optically precise grass, glass, which was called cristallo, crystal, and crystal glass mirrors. And they held a monopoly over mirror production for more than a century. And one of these mirrors just to kind of place it in perspective, cost three times as much as a, an original painting by Raphael. This is a Venetian Murano mirror from the 17th century. And the amount you would pay to have such a mirror on the wall would be about the same you would pay for a large battleship. <laughs> so mirrors were not 
um, items that were available to most ordinary people, and most ordinary people never saw themselves in mirrors. The uh, spread of mirrors began initially with the industrial espionage, where King Louis XIV, uh, when he was building Versailles, built a, uh, a, a room which is called the Hall of Mirrors, if anybody's been to Versailles, which the whole thing was coated with mirrors. And the way in which they got this was that his, um, his uh, financial advisor, who was kind of the Jared Kushner of his, um, of his regime, uh, uh, went and kidnapped some of the Murano glassmakers and brought them to France to work for the king. And this, this whole place now was filled with mirrors and it allowed royalty to uh, watch themselves rather than looking at boring paintings on the walls. And then this also gave rise to the beginning of self-portraiture. Self-portraiture is not an art form that existed prior to the development of mirrors. It coincides, in fact, with mirror production. This is, according to Wikipedia, this is the first self-portrait by Jean Fouquet. Uh, other people say it's Van Eck, a self-portrait of a, a man in a red turban, 1433. Most people, uh, the availability of to see oneself doesn't really happen until the 1830s and 40s, and it's propelled by where you begin to have a mass culture of visual self-regard, where ordinary people begin to see themselves for the first time. And it's propelled by politics, and it's also propelled by developments in science and industry. In terms of politics, and this was all very much related to sort of laissez-faire capitalism in the United States, um, the idea of individualism is a creation of the 1830s. There's this guy, uh, Alexis de Tocqueville, um, who in, came to the United States in 1830 and wrote a two-volume book called Democracy in America. And in Democracy in America, he talks about something curious about our society, and he says, uh, individualism is a novel expression to which a novel idea has given birth. The woof of time is every instant broken, and the track of generations is erased. Those who went before are soon forgotten. Of those who will come after, no one has any idea. The interest of man is confined to those in close proximity to himself. Thus, not only does democracy make every man forget his ancestors, but it hides his descendants and separates his contemporaries from him. It throws him back forever upon himself alone and threatens in the end to confine him entirely within the solitude of his own heart. So, at least American democracy was one in which the individual became cut off from any sense of where he or she came from or where he or she was going. It was all about living in the now for oneself within the solitude of one's own heart. During the same period of time, you have for the first time modern industrial techniques for producing, obviously, photography and mirrors and plate glass. This is one of the first photographs from 1839, a guy named Robert Cornelius, and he took a selfie in the mirror. Mass-produced plate glass, the ability to produce glass where people could actually see their own reflections, didn't get developed until the late 1840s. We're used to it. We go by stores and we see ourselves and we look at the products behind and we're offered this invidious comparison between us and things that we're supposed to buy. Plate glass was something that was unimaginable and in England, at the uh, International Expedition of 1851, they built a whole building called the Crystal Palace made out of plate glass, where people could experience this phenomenon. Previously, it didn't exist. You had affordable silvered glass mirrors. This is a stereograph. It's really great in 3D. Uh, this woman is sitting surrounded by mirrors. We also have 
ordinary folks taking pictures of themselves in mirrors using photography, obviously, 1907. And not only that, but this idea of becoming an image, of be becoming transformed into an image, begins to enter into the popular culture. In 1921, a fan magazine has a fame and fortune contest, telling people that they should send in pictures of themselves posing as movie stars, and if they win the contest, they get a bit part in a movie. And there was a girl, who's a student at Bay Ridge High School, nearby, uh, uh, who was very shy, had a stutter, difficulty socially, and she would go to the movies to escape, and then she would go home and pose in front of the mirror, and she sees this thing, and she sends in a picture of herself um, posing in front of a mirror. And she gets the part, she wins the contest, and she becomes Clara Bow, who is the first American sex symbol, um, offering this, this kind of corridor between everyday life and becoming an image. And then, of course, by 1925, you have the development of selfie technology, which is available in every five and 10 cent store, where you can go in and take your pictures. Now the question remains, what are the psychic or social consequences when the, visual, when the visualization of self, when individuality takes hold? And it's interesting because there is this ancient myth of Narcissus that you know of which comes from Ovid, uh, poet Ovid from the 8th century AD. But in fact, the story of Narcissus is a relatively remote story, and it's really in the early 20th century that people begin to become fascinated with it. In artwork, this is a painting done in 1903 called Echo and Narcissus. The story is Echo brings Narcissus to the pool. She's going to seduce him, or hopes he will seduce her and instead he falls in love with himself. Uh, I, I would have gone for Echo any day of the week. In 1927, there was this guy, D.H. Lawrence, well known for a novel called Lady Chatterley's Lover. And he writes a letter to an American psychoanalyst named Trigon Burrow. And in the letter he says, it is being cut off that is our ailment. And from that, everything bad arises. I wish I saw a clear how to escape from this feeling of cut offness. Myself, I suffer badly from being so cut off, but what is one to do? And then he continues, the real trouble lies in the sense of separateness that dominates every man. This is something that was repeated again and again, that this kind of discover of the self and of being an individual of being an image coincides with a loss of a sense of connection to others and also a desperate desire to find connection with others. And maybe this has something to do with sexting, I don't know. I've only done it on rare occasions. This sense of separateness is something that we all tend to carry within us, this sense of being an I. And it comes with what Lawrence describes as an aloneness and sometimes desperate desire to connect with others. Burrow called it the I persona. And he viewed it as a sign of social and personal neurosis. This idea that the I is the center of the universe. And one of the things he says is that, or he said, he's no longer alive, um, well, he's still alive, what the hell? We're all alive. Um, the, our ancestors are in this room right now. Um, one of the things he says is that when one is fixated on being I, that attention arises in the ocular facial region of the head, and it causes attention. And that tension is something that creates a physiological boundary between the self and others. In other words, as long as we see ourselves purely as the center of the visual universe, it places everybody else at a distance. And 
this physiological boundary, Burrow argued, was in fact the seat of all social and personal turmoil. Whether or not this is true, I cannot say. But it's something to think about as we explore the world of sexting a little further this evening. Thank you.